Was there really a worldwide flood as described in the book of Genesis? If so, what kind of scientific evidence do we have for this? Can we see remnants of a global deluge in the Earth's rock layers? Let's take a look at some real life, real obvious scientific evidence for this catastrophic event. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, The Genesis Flood Part 2 with Jay Siegert. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Jay Siegert, is an author and international speaker and holds degrees in both physics and engineering technology. He currently serves as the managing director of the Starting Point Project which defends the Christian worldview, and he is also the president of Logos Research Associates. Jay has been speaking on the authority of Scripture for over 38 years. Welcome to the program, Jay. Great to be back on the show again. Well, I've been looking forward to this program. We started off a while back. We did the Genesis Flood Part 1. Now we're going to the Genesis Flood Part 2. What are we going to get into? Sure. Well, in part one, we looked at the significance of the flood because too many Christians, they say, yeah, there was a flood in the Old Testament, but they kind of downplay it and don't realize how significant it was. So we spent a fair amount of time talking about that and whether it was local or not. And, you know, they consciously or subconsciously first go to other sources for truth, the academic society, geology, astronomy, whatever it is, and they, they just accept that as true. And then they go into God's Word to try to figure out, well, what does it really mean knowing what I know now, which is kind of backwards. We should really start with God's Word and use that to better understand the conclusions of some of the secular geologists and astronomers. And they want to please man more than God, which Scripture warns us about. So they, they don't want to just take Scripture for what it says because then they, they would lose the, approval, the approval of the academic society. Mm -hmm. This time, part two, we're going to be getting into the scientific evidences, which is what people really want. You know, what are these evidences that helps them defend their faith even better? So that's where we're headed, and we'll get started with that. Well, Jay, this is a topic that I'm very much interested in because as a minister, so many times I hear people say, well, I don't believe in a global flood because of the science. And we're about to show them you should believe in the global flood, and it's because of the science. Right. Many claim that there's no evidence for a global flood. We're going to be taking a look at that evidence right now. Well, I can't wait. Let's get started. In one of my own video series, we cover about eight lines of scientific evidence for the Noah's flood, Genesis 6 through 8. We're going to be looking at five of these with the time that we have. We'll jump right into it. Evidence number one. We have marine fossils on top of mountains including Mount Everest, about five and a half miles high. How do you get sea creatures fossilized on top of mountains unless at some point in the past they were covered with waters? We have crinoids and ammonites and other sea creatures fossilized on mountain ranges all over the planet. Now, Jay, does anyone deny this? Are there secularists or evolutionists who say, no, there aren't any marine fossils on, on the Himalayas? No, they actually can't deny it, so they spin it a little differently say yes okay they were lower in the past but over millions of years oceans came in and buried those things and then they rose up slowly over millions of years so they agree there are fossils up there but they just throw a longer time frame on it so they say at some point it was underwater it had they to be and to want to make it secrets. way 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 back yeah yes okay. again it's always twisting the, the time frame which there really isn't evidence for second line of evidence we have rapid burial of plants and animals so we're going to be talking about this the standard story of fossilization. How does that occur? Well, typical story, maybe you have a dinosaur dies in a stream and the water's coming in and burying it, bringing in sediments slowly over time and more sediments are coming in, burying it further. Sometimes the sediments get uplifted a little bit and then you have more erosion on it, exposing some of the bones and that's how we discover these fossils. Well, that's kind of a silly story 
if a creature died, especially in a riverbed, it's going to rot away very quickly. It will never get fossilized. It would have to actually be buried very rapidly. So these types of scenarios really don't make any sense, scientifically speaking. And we do have a lot of evidence for very rapid burial of these creatures. Here's a fish inside of another fish. This fish got buried so quickly it didn't have time to digest its dinner. Here's another fish. This fish was buried so rapidly it didn't have time to swallow its lunch. And you can see the minute details on these things. They were not laying on a riverbed after they died for hundreds or thousands of years. They were buried so quickly those details got preserved. Then we have rapid or no erosion between the layers. This is very significant. This is my son and I a few years ago. I was invited to go down to Arizona, give some lectures, and then go up to the canyon and actually hike all the way down. I lead tours of the canyon, but we just walk along the rim and take a raft around the river. This was going to be hiking all the way down to the bottom. It was in February. The top was actually completely covered with snow and ice. We had spikes on our boots. So as we were going down, we were going down this trail here, winds all the way around and just keeps going and going. You'll see in the circle here, uh, people for scale there. And our goal was to get all the way down to the bottom to the inner gorge, Phantom Ranch, stay overnight. It's one mile vertically down, but it takes about 11 miles to hike all the way down, about six hours. So it's uh, quite the trip. And along the way, we pass all the layers. Here's a cutout of Grand Canyon. Everyone's seen those pictures. So as we're hiking down, we're going down past those layers. There's two in particular I draw your attention to, Coconino Sandstone and Hermit Shale. We're specifically going to be looking at the contact point between these two. So here I was, there's the Coconino Sandstone and the Hermit Shale. The secular scientists, knowing now that these layers must have been laid out fairly rapidly because of the billions of fossils, they try to put the time in between the layers. So they really believe that there's about 10 million years of Earth history in between these two layers. Now this was from last summer, I was down there, it's much nicer, warmer, but you can see this contact point here. It's like a mason took a trowel and just scraped it straight across. There's no way that this bottom layer sat there exposed for 10 million years of Earth history. You would see erosion on that layer. You'd see soil developing, plants growing, bioturbation, animals burrowing up and down, and then the next layer would be laid down there. But here, there's no evidence of anything happening. But they have to hold on to that because you're finding fossils in the layers, so they had to be rapid. The only place you can put the time then is between the layer, and, and we're talking about, yeah, something that just makes no sense, but they're committed to the theory, I guess. Got to put the time somewhere, and we'll be looking at that further. Here's two more layers we'll take a look at, red wall limestone and the Muav limestone. They believe there's 160 million years of Earth history with no evidence of anything happening in between. And then towards the bottom, the Tapit sandstone. This is the first sedimentary layer of the flood on the bottom. Below that, the Vishnu schist. This is original creation rock. Between those things, where the flood started, secular geologists say there's missing about a billion years of Earth history. Missing, meaning there's no evidence that a billion years went by that, but they need to stick that much time in there. So the story gets kind of crazy. So here we have the actual Grand Canyon. Blue there is that Tapit sandstone, the first sedimentary layer of the flood. Below that, the Vishnu schist, original creation rock. What's interesting about that is we go back to Wisconsin, where I'm from. A little less than two hours from my home, there's a place called Devil's Lake. It's very beautiful. Actually, there's Russ Miller in a picture. He's done some shows here. He and I do some Grand Canyon tours. He was at Wisconsin. I said, hey, Russ, i got to show you something. You're going to be fascinated. So we took him to Devil's Lake. This is Devil's Doorway. But what I really wanted to show him was this. Most people would walk by this and not think anything of it. But this is original creation rock. Just like we saw this line between the Tapit Sandstone and the original creation rock where that flood started, this is what's called the Great Unconformity. The two layers don't conform. Geologists know something major happened, and they call it the Great Unconformity because we see it all over the planet. Well, this line between original creation rock and the flood can be found right there in Wisconsin. You can actually walk up to it rather than hiking a mile down. In Wisconsin, locally, we call it the Baraboo Quartzite. 
and above that you've got quartzite boulders that were churned up by the flood sitting here and then in between we have Jordan sandstone that's a conglomerate but that's where the flood occurred and again you can walk right up to it at Devil's Lake in Wisconsin powerful evidence for the flood. Does that mean that in Wisconsin the creation uh, level would have been a, a, like a hill because you had to get up to it? Yeah, we're actually walking up to it. It's higher. There would have been less sedimentary layers deposited there, a lot more down by the Grand Canyon, but towards the middle of the continent, less layers there. So it's not like you have a mile of layers that would have been above that, but you have a few of those layers that are still there, and it's easy to get to because you can walk up within about eight minutes. And we wouldn't point. find any fossils then in that original Not below, area. you wouldn't in the, in, uh, the Baraboo Quartz site because it's more metamorphic rock there. So here's the idea of these layers in the earth. Geologists for many, many years taught that each of these layers, they were laid down slowly by natural processes over hundreds of thousands and millions of years. But then when they realized that the only way you're going to get fossils is by burying these things very rapidly. So they realized, okay, they were buried rapidly. Well, then they lose their millions of years. So they were creative, put the time in between the layers. Visually, this is why this is a problem. So let's say this layer was laid down rapidly because we have fossils in it. If it sat there for millions of years, you would see erosion in the top of that layer. Then the next layer would come along very rapidly and fill that in with fossils there in the layer. Then if that sat there for millions of years, you'd see more erosion, sometimes very significant erosion. Then that would get filled in by the next layer rapidly, making fossils. And if that sat there, you'd see more erosion on that. Point is this, if you look at the contact between these layers, kind of goes all over the place because of what we should expect to see with the erosion. This is what we should observe in the rock record if the evolutionary narrative is correct. This is what we actually see. <laughs> we see pancakes. I don't have time for a story. When I was speaking over in Russia, I was giving this talk. I showed the pancakes. The next day, a Russian woman who didn't speak English walked up to me, gave me some Tupperware. I got Russian pancakes. Oh, wow. Kind of fun. <laughs> Here's an example, painted desert in Arizona. The layers are going straight across like pancakes. No time in between these layers. More layers, no time in between. Grand Canyon, the whitish Coconino sandstone, again, no time in between. There's more layers, okay. These layers don't count, and the reason is there's no chocolate. So <laughs> it's a complete waste of calories there. Well, you know, Jay, uh, right off the bat, I mean, just you know, not knowing and, and investigating these things, but you know, water always lays flat. That's the nature of water. And if, if water was making these levels or layers, that's, that's what you would see, right? It's exactly what we would expect if there was a worldwide flood depositing them that way and then sheet erosion cutting them off like a crew cut, which we see down by the Grand Canyon and other places. So these layers here we have something called poly straight fossils. Poly meaning many, straight meaning strata. Many layers here, fossils going up through multiple layers. These are fossils of trees. So here's the standard story. Let's say this layer was laid down 200 million years ago. And then this tree apparently started growing in that layer and it stood there for millions of years <laughs> waiting for the other layers to eventually bury it. It's physically impossible. The tree would have rotted away yeah, long before. Even if you could make it stand, it would rot away. It would rot I mean. away. And if you notice the bottoms of these trees, they're missing something. We like to call them root systems. These trees were not growing here. They were growing somewhere else catastrophically uprooted, torn away from the root systems and rapidly redeposited in a short amount of time like a global flood. Sometimes we see these trees laying sideways. They obviously weren't growing there. Here's an actual photo of a polystrate fossil tree going up through multiple layers. So this is all evidence of rapid deposition and one after another. Fourth line of evidence, greatly folded rock layers. I don't know if you've ever tried to fold a rock before. No, don't waste recently. your time. Even if you were strong enough, the layers would just shatter. Here's my wife and I over in England when I was speaking there, and you could see the layers here, there's people at the top for scale, the layers here are greatly folded, but there's no shattering. These layers were not laid down slowly over millions of years and then folded, they were laid down rapidly during the flood, and before they could harden, plates are moving, folding up like an accordion, and they subsequently harden afterwards. Mm. More from England, greatly folded layers and no evidence of fracturing. They were laid down catastrophically and folded later. Fifth line of evidence, the number of canyons on the planet. Most people are familiar with Bill Nye, the science guy. In one of his debates, he said this, if this great flood drained through the Grand Canyon, wouldn't there have been a Grand Canyon on every continent? 
How could there not have been Grand Canyons everywhere if this water drained away in this extraordinarily short amount of time? It's actually a good question. Well, what Bill Nye doesn't know is there are actually canyons all over the planet. <laughs> Here's just one example of when the Himalayas, again, where Mount uh, Everest is. This canyon is massive. It's more than three times deeper than Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon is about a mile deep. This is 3.3, 3, 308 miles long. Grand Canyon is about 277. If we take that basin area and line it up on a map of the United States, it takes up the amount of land of Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. Grand Canyon only takes the space up a little sliver in northern Arizona, so this one is much, much bigger than Grand Canyon. And then we have one in Nambia, Africa, one in South Africa, one in Tibet, China, another in New South Wales, Australia, one in Taiwan, one in Peru, one in Romania, and then a big one in Mexico, and then there's a few more. <laughs> And then there's a few more. There are about 300 canyons all over the planet. And if that wasn't enough already, and don't you think it should be, if you act now, we'll throw in this one for free. In 2013, not that long ago, they discovered one they'd never noticed before. It was under an ice sheet. This one is 460 miles long. It's two-thirds longer than the Grand Canyon, 2,600 feet deep. How do we miss that? I thought science has discovered everything, but we just recently discovered another massive canyon. And then we'll throw in one more for free, the deepest land canyon just been discovered, you know, a few years ago in Antarctica, 2019. It reaches 2.2 miles below sea level. Some are deeper, but this one goes deeper below sea level. Never noticed that one before. So there's a lot of evidence for these canyons all over the planet. Well, Jay, I'm going to have to stop you right there. I'd love to get more into this, but we have to take a break. Stay with us. More on the Genesis flood right after this. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Jay Siegert, who's been sharing about the Genesis Flood, Part 2. Jay, just before the break, we heard an argument from Bill Nye, which said that if there was a global flood, there should be canyons all over the world, and you just showed us 300 canyons all over the road, world. Sounds like Bill Nye was right. Well, in a sense, he was. He brought <laughs> it up, and I would say thanks for, for mentioning that. Yeah. yeah, we have about 300 canyons all over the planet. It's indicative of there having been a worldwide flood. I'll bet you he backs off from that point now, though. He makes it at the beginning, but now that we say what well, there is, I'm sure he said, well, that has nothing to do with a worldwide flood. He wouldn't flood. mention that one the second time. <laughs> <laughs> well, where are we going to go, then, as we're looking at canyons? Well, looking at canyons, we've got to bring up briefly Mount St. Helens. I think you've done shows on that, so we're not going to go into a lot of details, just something that's related to what we're talking about today. I did a co-led a tour of Mount St. Helens uh, recently with Steve Austin and a number of others. And we know it erupted in 1980, but uh, left a lot of logs in Spirit Lake. So there's a picture I got to hike down and actually see those logs closer up. There's still about a half a million logs in the lake from when Mount St. Helens erupted, just from the initial steam blast and some other things. Very powerful event. But what I want to draw our attention to is two years later, um, in 1982, in a sense, there was a burp in the cone and a mud flow came out and it carved a 140th scale Grand Canyon 
in solid rock in one day. A little bit of a mud flow, a lot of damage just from mud. So here's the, they actually call it the Little Grand Canyon. That was carved in one day from a mud flow. In fact, it actually carved a series of canyons. Now what's interesting, when you look at that, it does look familiar. It looks similar to the Grand Canyon. It so certainly does. This is actually now the Grand Canyon that we're looking at. And if we go back to Mount St. Helens, this is uh, a series of canyons carved up by the mud flow in one day. And now we put them side by side. <laughs> Are these two things completely different? No, they look very similar. Well, if one happened in one day from a little bit of mud, why would it take millions of years of the Colorado River, you know, carving those layers, which is actually a silly story. What we've learned from real science, we've observed, we saw this happen. It happened in a day. You could apply that to the Grand Canyon and very easily see how that whole thing could have been carved out catastrophically in a very short period of time, especially if you're talking about an amount of water that was covering the entire continent. You know, that's something that the kids really need to be taught in schools. They need to see that and say, wait a minute, let's go by observable, testable, scientific evidence because nobody could say that, well, maybe Mount St. Helens happened over, uh, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years. We know 1980 was the eruption. And then we know when that mud flow happened. And so that's, that's undeniable, that's concrete. Anything on the left side of the page is conjecture. Nobody saw it, right? Nobody can test it. Right, so why not go by what we see and know and let that speak to the unknown, but it seems like we do the opposite right now in the scientific community. Right, and it's all about the narrative driving that. They're only letting one narrative be taught in the school system, so everything in the past that we didn't see, they're just going to assume it took natural processes long periods of time, even though we can see today supernatural and catastrophic processes happening in a very short period of time. That, that long time is just, again, so important. We've seen that in program after program, that, that that can't be let go of. I mean, they're holding on to that like grim death. I mean, they have to hold on to millions of years, billions of years, because that determines the length of time for the evolution and life, and, and then the evolution and life shows that it had to be millions of years, and they use that to back each other up. and. You know, uh, we've seen so many times all of that is just on a foundation of sand. It's just not there. The reality, the, the evidence isn't there. We can't afford to give that up. And why does it, any of this matter? It's really not even so much about the flood itself. It's about death. How did death get into our world and when did it get mm -hmm. here? Again, we go back to the Garden of Eden and everyone, everyone watching this program has a question to answer. First of all, we know for a fact there are many layers in the earth. We've been looking at those layers. We know for a fact those layers are filled with billions of fossils. That's why we call it the fossil record. Nobody on the planet denies that. That's just a fact. We also know that these fossils represent death, disease, pain, and suffering. They're creatures that were living that are no longer living. They died. They got buried. That is also a fact. The question that everyone has to answer is, how did this happen? How do we get all these layers on the planet filled with billions of dead things? If you believe, even as a Christian, that God just used natural history, there was a Big Bang and the earth formed over hundreds of millions of years, natural processes building up those layers, you'd have to believe that God did that. And then when all the layers were done, God plants a garden in the top and puts Adam and Eve in it. That makes God responsible for death, disease, pain, and yeah. suffering because all that happened long before Adam and Eve were even on the planet. On the other hand, if you believe those layers were laid down catastrophically by a worldwide flood, that means man is responsible for sin. Romans 5.12, it was by Adam's sin that brought death into the world, and things got so bad after that, almost 1,700 years later, God says, that's it, I'm going to destroy the planet, and he sends the flood. So, are these layers, is it just a snapshot of God's process of creation? He used hundreds of millions of years of natural processes, or is it actually a very graphic picture of God's judgment on sin that necessitated God sending his son Jesus Christ to die on a cross. Christians need to decide what they believe about that and that will drive their view on the age of the earth. It all really comes back to the authority of scripture. Do we believe what the Bible says or do we go somewhere else and bring that truth into God's word? Psalm 119, 160 says, thy word is true from the beginning. Genesis is the beginning. If we can't trust him for what he says about that, how can we trust God for anything else? You know, Jay, I was thinking of a scripture that really right at the beginning of the book of Genesis, and God saw all that he had made and it was good. And again, if we take that analogy that you gave, 
that if there were all these millions of years that were happening and creatures were living and dying and killing each other and, you know, I mean, I've seen uh, animals die and the fear in their eyes and, you know, uh, of a snake getting a rabbit and things like that and the rabbit shaking and, and the fear. And, and you have to say, well, God said all that was good. I mean, there's, you'd have to say that, that for millions of years, all this death and all this disease and decay, God pronouncing it good. And I think... Um, while we do that, and we've really given up something, because at that point, then, really was it sin that caused man to die? Everything else was dying before sin. And how can we actually conclude that death is the judgment on sin? And then if death isn't the judgment on sin, then why do I need a savior? Right, and also if God's gonna restore everything, which Revelation says, if the original great creation had death, disease, pain, and suffering, then maybe the restored creation is going to have death, disease, pain, and suffering because that would have apparently been part of God's creation before Adam was here. So just another reason to mm. say, no, everything was perfect the way God did it. Mankind arrived. We chose to reject God's principles. That brought death and suffering into God's perfect world. We look to a, a new heavens and, and a new earth where there will be no more pain and no more sorrow and no more death. Revelation says. And so uh, that's what we're seeing here, that the Genesis flood is a result of God's judgment on man's sin, just as death was before that. Well, Jay, I'd love to talk to you more about this, but unfortunately we have to end the program. Um, for decades, Christians have been told that science proves that there could not be a global flood like we find in the book of Genesis at the time of Noah. Today, we know more than ever before that the real scientific evidence actually supports the reality of a global flood, just like what we read in the book of Genesis. It just goes to show you that we, we know the Bible is true and the proof of that, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to help keep this Creation TV program on the air. Your support both prayerfully and financially make a big impact, so let's work together and reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2404, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.